grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning's meditation is that epistle reading read a moment ago from Philippians chapter 3. Now my friends in Christ, I am, I am not someone who enjoys an airplane ride. Even now my hands are sweaty even thinking of it. You see, I have a fear, a true fear of flying, and it stems really from an incident that, took, that occurred many years ago when Marcy and I were flying out to New Hampshire to visit our children who were living there at the time. And from Des Moines to Manchester, New Hampshire, there's not a direct flight. So you have to go through O'Hare. <laughs> you know where I'm headed. So I won't bore you with the, the details of what happened that day, but what I will say is that there was no better sound than the screaming of the plane wheels when they finally landed on the tarmac. In fact, everyone in that plane cheered. It was a powerful and a beautiful moment. <laughs> We're down on the ground. A little subtext to that. We had to get on another plane to head to Manchester after that. But now I want you to think of that, that sound of those wheels hitting the tarmac. And as we, as, especially as we look at these words in, our, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul wrote to this church for a number of reasons. He wanted to thank them for their generosity, and he wanted to remind them of the beauty of the gospel in their lives. But I think most of all, Paul wrote to encourage these Christians. You see, they were being persecuted from all sides. They were being overrun by false teachers of all kinds just, just, and just facing difficult times in general. They were facing a real temptation to leave behind the very basic and central teaching of the gospel, the death of Christ for our sins and the resurrection from the dead, in favor of other ideas that were more popular or, shall we say, easier for their culture. It, was an easy, it wasn't an easy time for the church. But really, the shocking thing in this text for me is how much one Greek word, or actually in this whole letter, how much one Greek word appears over and over again. In Greek, it's the word kairite, which means rejoice. And it's actually how the Greeks greeted one another. Instead of just saying, hello, how you doing, buddy, and all that kind of thing, they actually see one another and say, rejoice. I know you, and I see you, and I am rejoicing because of it. And that fits with God, too. Rejoice. I know God. Rejoice. God knows me. And the sound of that word rejoice is like the sound of those wheels on the plane hitting the ground. It's the sound of joy, of living joy, touching down on real life, even though the times and the places and the circumstances of the runways of our lives are pretty rough and pretty dangerous not easy to have the joy that's in our minds land on our hearts and then get played out in real life. For instance, you know, you know that Jesus Christ went to the cross to destroy death and to give you the gift of eternal life. You know that because of what Jesus did for you on that cross, your sins are forgiven. You are covered in the righteousness of Christ and you are declared holy and just before the almighty God's throne. And you know that on that day of resurrection, you will experience never-ending joy and peace as you stand face to face with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All of these things are true. So then, why do we worry? Why do we worry so much about the future? Why do we get upset about criticism? Why are we still unhappy with our achievements in life or, or even our situation in life? See, I think sometimes we're really good at knowing the head stuff, if you will, but sometimes we struggle with living out that hope and joy that we have in Christ. And I'll admit it, it's hard to do. But you see, that's why the Holy Spirit gave Paul these words in our text and why they're so important for us today. They're helpful for a couple of reasons. They help to redefine what it means to know God and to be known by God. But most of all, these verses help us to understand what joy really is. It's about knowing, a, it's, it's 
not about knowing a definition or some kind of explanation at all. It's all about knowing God. It's all about knowing what Christ has done for you and knowing that God knows you and that he loves you. And that's an important distinction. And Paul here, he wastes no time getting to that point. Reading again verse 8, he says, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And he goes on and says, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain and this verse really fits in with the larger theme of the, of the letter of Paul to the Philippians, especially found in chapter 4, that beautiful verse 4 of chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Awesome words, aren't they? But truthfully, when you hear those words and when you read those words, uh, does a part of you think, really? Rejoice Always, Paul, are you serious? Sometimes we don't give that plane full of joy very good places to land, do we? We don't find it easy to rejoice all the time. In fact, a lot of things can make you pretty unrejoicing. Of course, that's a word, but I like it. We don't rejoice in the Lord when we find that the, the price of gas has gone up. Or when our medical bills are really high, or our bank account is really sick. How can Paul say what he says and mean it? Does he mean it? Oh, yes, he means it. If there was ever a man who had credibility when it came to being able to rejoice even in hard times, it's this man, Paul. He tells us in his second letter to the church in Corinth that he had received 39 lashes five times. He was beaten with rods three times. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked more than once. And he was in many other dangers throughout his ministry. I mean, wow. How could he have gone through all that and still have anything resembling joy? The answer, the answer is in how we define joy. Because for Paul, Joy was knowing the one thing that no pain, no happiness, no circumstances, good or bad, could compare. It was knowing the one thing that makes anything and everything, everything else, seem like rubbish, he says, in comparison. He knew Christ. And knowing Christ is joy. Joy that just surpasses everything. All of Paul's previous life, all of the accomplishments as a, as a Pharisee, all of Paul's sins, all of his following of the law and the rules and the regulations, rubbish, he says. Worthless when held next to Christ who saved him. And not according to his works or his merit, but according to his grace. Everything else seems dark when compared to the light of Christ's death for our sins and his resurrection from the dead. This is the joy that nothing, not even death, can touch. It doesn't matter if I die in my sleep or for, from some illness or something else. I will always have the joy of that empty tomb before me. It's kind of hard to argue with that, isn't it? But that's what it means to, to live out the all-surpassing worth of Christ in our lives. That's what it means to have a, a living faith hit real life joy Joy isn't some show that we put on or some false front at all. It doesn't mean just putting on a happy faith and pretending that everything is just great. No. No, indeed. Joy in Christ means that we go straight into those rough times where we may even get hurt and we face down real disappointments. But in all of those things, we know that Christ died for our sins, that he rose from the dead, and so we have a joy that none of this rubbish can take from us. We know the future. And our future gives us hope to live today. It gives us a place to, to fix our eyes in every circumstance. As Paul says, we look ahead, not behind. We look to the resurrection hope, not the wreckage of life in this world. We look to the ultimate prize, not fixating on temporary problems. We look God's grace. That's what Paul says. Not that I've already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, he says, 
but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And he goes on and says, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Jesus Christ. You see, knowing your future can affect how you live your present. And my friends, in Christ, you do know your future. Not every moment, not every situation or problem but you do know how it ultimately works out. You know, who's, you know who wins in the end. And you know what the prize is already and has been won for you on your behalf. You know. You know that because our Lord died for your sins and rose from the dead, you can live right now in the presence and praise of your Lord. My friends in Christ, how awesome it will be. How awesome it will be when this story is played out before our eyes but how awesome it is to have that sure and certain hope right now. It's the joy that lands on every part of your life, the hope that cannot and will not be overcome. So rejoice, say it with me, rejoice in Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus now and always.